representing functors in order to solve Diophantine equations. Representing functors, it's, it's an abstract idea that on the face of it has nothing to do with Diophantine equations, but as an abstract idea, it has many instances, and solutions to Diophantine equations can be presented as an instance, and this is in fact a good way to organize a subject sometimes, and is the way the subject was organized in the proof of Fermat's last theorem. So, Mazur quotes this at conference because he's not kidding that 20 years ago he, fir he was firmly convinced that Leinster was convinced he did, he did not want to represent functors. Of course, mathematicians are trying to get answers to their problems. They're not trying to learn new tools. Any new tool looks like it might be a distraction, and it could be a distraction. You could, you could waste your entire career looking at new methods and never get anything done. Leinster did not want to learn these new methods until he saw that they were the way to get things, that get certain things done that he wanted to do. Um, that's what category theory does, and I, I do wish that philosophers of mathematics would more routinely take an interest in how things are actually being done in modern math. And in particular, here's something that I think goes beyond philosophy of mathematics. I think philosophers of mathematics need to understand that mathematicians are doing a generally very good job of these things. These things work because they work well. They really are good tools. And if we want to do things in, say, analytic metaphysics, if we want to come up with new kinds of structures of space, we want to do the metaphysics of space, we say, I'm not sure it should be a set of points, well, what should it be beside the set of points? Or well, we've got some tools that are working geometrically with things that aren't sets of points. Maybe a given mathematical tool will not solve a given philosophical problem. Of course that could be the case. Or again, maybe it will, and if that one doesn't, maybe some other one will. But I think philosophers of mathematics need to understand that modern mathematics is being done very, very well. Leinster did not rush into this new stuff just because it was new. He resisted going into it. He got into it, but he found out it worked. And we need to know that mathematicians are doing that. Category theory grew from traditional working structural mathematics. It's, it, it, was not, it was not invented for philosophical reasons. I think uh, Frege's logic was, was invented for largely philosophical reasons. And people argue Dedekind's motives in, say, defining, in, in creating the Dedekind Pano axioms, in defining real numbers as Dedekind cups. People argue, was that philosophically motivated? Did he, did he need it in his mathematics? Actually, he, we know he didn't need it in his mathematics. But the methods are like methods he did use in his mathematics. So it's, it's not clear. Um, 
but Hilbert's interest in logic was primarily philosophical. He really he didn't use it in his own mathematics. He didn't expect people to use it in their mathematics. It was a philosophical interest. I teach in a philosophy department. I'm not against philosophical interests, but I, have, I do want to be clear what are, what are the reasons for things. Um, category theory was not created out of philosophical interest. It was created to solve problems by people who didn't think it had any philosophical relevance. But by people like Saunders MacLean, I forgot to mention when I, when I put him up, Saunders MacLean lived with Hermann Weil for a year in Gothic in Germany in 1932. Saunders MacLean heard David Hilbert lecture. Now, you've never met Saunders, so maybe it's less impressive to you. I used to walk around with Saunders. I walked around with a guy who heard David Hilbert lecture. Saunders lived a long time. Um, he lived with, with Hermann Weil, and they talked about philosophy of mathematics. Weil has his book, uh, Natural Science and Philosophy of Mathematics, or Philosophy of Mathematics and Natural Science. They talked about how to translate that into English. Saunders MacLean came back to, from Germany in 1934. Good idea. He didn't want to be there in 35. Um, and became a founding member of the Association for Symbolic Logic. The first year, he was one of the first members of the Association for Symbolic Logic. He was interested in logic, which not all working mathematicians are, but he, he absolutely was. He was. He's always been interested in philosophy. He had, he had I think, very interesting thoughts about philosophy, but he did not invent category theory for those reasons. He didn't think this had anything to do with his philosophical or logical interests when he invented it. And, in fact, in 1965, when he went to visit Columbia, and his friend Eilenberg, <coughs> who's going to render category theory, has his graduate student, Bill LaVere, Eilenberg takes Saunders McLean to the side and says, Saunders, you've got to talk to this grad student. He thinks he can do set theory using categories. And Saunders said, oh, I'll, I'll try to talk to him, but I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and Saunders went to Bill, and he said, Bill, you, you can't do that. No, because set theory is how it's, it's all done. And Lovier handed him a paper. And Saunders McLean did for something that, uh, say, uh, Solomon Fefferman said he shouldn't do, but he did it. He read the paper. He, he was sure he was going to find mistakes. He said, this, this, this can't be right. He's got to be assuming set theory at some point to get any set theory. He read the paper, and he's and he thought there weren't any mistakes. Well, he was right, there weren't any mistakes. Now, whether you want to get your set theory that way is another question, but whether you can, that's not a question, that's a mathematical theorem. Yes, you can. And, and Bill showed him that, and Saunders then puts that paper into the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where Paul can ask us to read it, but that's normal philosophers don't read it, the um, Saunders, even when he first heard that there of this logical sort of philosophical conclusions to be out from category theory didn't think they could be right. He came to believe they were right. But it was not invented for philosophical reasons, it was invented for mathematical reasons. Uh, few 19th century mathematicians thought elements of abstract spatial or algebraic structures could have properties other than those relating to other elements of the same structure. This is this philosophical theme of structuralism. That's, it's, I guess it's fair to say it's been the main question in philosophy of mathematics the last 20 years. It is not related French philosophical ideas of structuralism or post-structuralism. There's a, there's a brief connection because when um, Saussure, when, no, not Levi-Strauss, when Claude Levi-Strauss, one of the founding structuralist philosophers, uh, wanted a, to relate, wanted a structural theory of kinship, he went to André Vé, the mathematician, and, and asked, um, can you give us a mathematical theory of structures? And Vey wrote some something about this that, that then went on and that had an influence in category theory. But structuralism in philosophy of math
is to answer Benasserov's problem. Answer Benasserov's problem. Uh, one C. Two R's. Okay. Is it a problem or a question? That's where Chinese says it. It's a way to look at it. Okay. <laughs> um, how can we describe structures where the elements have no properties other than their relations in that structure? How can we describe the natural number structure, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, in such a way that these things have no properties other than their place in the structure? 0, we don't want it to be the empty set. We don't want to be, I mean, Actually, that's the only set anybody's ever taken for zero. It's kind of an obvious one for zero. But you could take anything, but they don't want to take anything. They don't want two to be the empty set. Two should not be the singleton of the singleton of the empty set. It should not be the set with two elements. These things should have nothing but their structural relations. This, I think, is, is hard for mathematicians, some mathematicians to understand for the same reason that in the 19th century mathematicians could never have understood this question because they didn't know any other way it could be. They thought, of course, 2 is the second natural number, and that's all it is. 2 is not this eraser. 2 isn't the door. 2 isn't anything except the second natural number. To them, this was just obvious. And if you'd said, oh, consider the possibility that 2 is the set whose only elements are the empty set and the singleton of the empty set. They would say, How do, what do you mean consider that? I can't consider that. That's nonsense. It just never occurred to, to most 19th century. Now, uh, and you know, it did not occur to Contour. Contour does not do this kind of thing. Zermelo does this kind of thing. And Zermelo specifically complains that Contour doesn't do these things. Contour says there's a set of all natural numbers. Contour certainly has a set of natural numbers. And he says every element of this set has as many predecessors as what it is. Three has three predecessors, and five has five predecessors. But he never identifies these things as sets. Contour never tells you what. Contour says there are as many ordered pairs of natural numbers as there are pairs of natural numbers. For every two natural numbers, there's an ordered pair of them. He never tells you what set this is. He doesn't do that. Even the power set of a set, Contour says, for any set S, there is a set which I'll call its power set that has as many elements as there are subsets of S. It doesn't say there are subsets of S. Contra doesn't go around identifying the elements of sets. This bothered Zermelo very, very much. Zermelo said this is irresponsible, we can't proceed this way because we can't tell what we're doing. And I think it's fair to say that Contour didn't have any very good explanation of what he was doing. And Zermelo did have a very good explanation of what he was doing when he created Zermelo and Frenkel's set theory. But Zermelo edited Contour's collected works, and he's got several paragraphs in there complaining that Contour messed this up, that he should have done what Frege does. Frege says, oh my goodness, Frege tells you what the number two is. Unfortunately, it's neither of those. Frege says the number two is the set of all two element sets of, well, I forget his exact words, of zero level entities. Frege's concepts come, lo come, come level. There's, there's infinitely many zero zero level entities. Um, these these might be physical objects, or they might be ideas. They might be anything like that. Uh, the number two is a set of sets of zero level entities. 
Which set is it? It's the set that contains a given set just in case it has an element A and an element B which aren't equal to each other and which are the only two elements. So this is not circular. He actually says there's an element A and an element B, and those are all the elements and they're not the same thing. But Frege tells you what set is the number two. Zermelo comes along and says, no, 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 that's not as good a way. Uh, let's better take two as the set whose only element is the set whose only element is the empty set. But he has the advantage, he says, I'm going to take this from Frege. I'm telling you what set is two. I've told you a specific set, this specific set is two. And that's how you ought to do how you ought to do foundations of mathematics, because otherwise you don't know what you're talking about. Zermelo says this, Contra does not, few mathematicians in the 19th century could ever have thought of such a thing. Uh, it might be interesting to go and ask around the math department here or at my university, what do you think the number two is? Um, I'm sure a lot of mathematicians say it's a set. I've heard there's a, there's a set theory that says what a set is. Um, others would say it's just the number two. I guess, I don't know. It would be interesting to do a set of that. But by the time Benasser posed his problem, philosophers in the U.S. were so immersed in Zermelo Frankel's set theory that he believed it had always been this way. He believed two had always been, well, either that set or else this one or maybe something else. He believed that the number two had always been understood to be some Zermelo Frankel set. Every Zermelo Frankel set has a unique collection of elements. Any two Zermelo Frankel sets differ in at least one way. There's some set that's an element of one and not of the other. Otherwise, they're the same set, that's the axiom of extensionality. Any two distinct Zermelo Frankel sets have some distinct property. And they were so immersed in the idea that mathematics is all about Zermelo Frankel sets that they thought it's a very hard problem. Mathematicians don't seem to talk this way. What can they be doing? How can they be making sense? And I had a, a student, uh, a graduate student, in a seminar that I gave at Notre Dame on, on category theory, insisted that Zermelo was right. Contra cannot have understood what he was doing if he didn't do this. I think Contra understood what he was doing. And Zermelo is quite right that Contra didn't do this. Zermelo is very clear that he wasn't. And you read Contra, he wasn't doing this. Um, So now, so then, so it's not just about natural numbers. What are the points of the Euclidean plane? Well, first of all, let's just take the Euclidean plane itself. I can't draw anything on it because it doesn't come with coordinates. It's just the ordinary, the, the Euclidean plane, it's got all these symmetry. What are the points of the Euclidean plane? Well, Hilbert never says in his foundations of geometry. Euclid never says in Euclid's geometry. Almost no mathematician in the 19th century could ever have understood the question, what is a point of the Euclidean plane? They have said, I can tell you the relations between points on the Euclidean plane. I can tell you that when you've got any two of them, there's a line connecting them. I can tell you that if you've got three of them joined in a triangle, and a point inside that triangle and a point outside, the line connecting them meets the triangle. I can tell you the relations between points in the Euclidean plane. But if, but if you'd ask them what are the points of the Euclidean plane, they'd have said, well, they're the points. There's, there aren't anything else. And yet, by 1970, what was it, 1965, this, this other viewpoint, this Zermelo and Franco viewpoint, was so influential that Benassar thought this was a really tough problem. How can we describe structures like the natural numbers in the Euclidean plane so that the elements have no properties other than relations to, that, to the other elements in that structure? When you, when you think about Euclid's geometry, even if you've never read the geometry, I never read Euclid's geometry. You don't have to have read it to believe me when I tell you this. First proposition. Given a line, construct an equilateral, well, a line. Construct an equilateral triangle on that line. He says, take a compass, lay off this circular arc. Now, lay off this circular arc. 
and then connect those points. Um, the next proposition, I forget what it is, but pretty soon he gives a proposition showing that if these, if two sides of a triangle are equal, then the opposite angles are also equal. I think you'll believe me that if you'd asked Euclid, where is this triangle compared to that one? You'd have said, they're on different theorems. There's no, this, this triangle is not to be found 10 feet from that one or 20 feet from that one. They're in different theorems. These points and lines have relations to each other. They have no relation to these points and lines. This is a different theorem. They took it for granted that these structures have no properties other than those relating them to other elements of the same structure. But like I say, philosophers of mathematics in the U.S. were so ingrained in Zermelo Frankel by, by 1965 that Benassar thinks this is a challenge. How can, we, how can we do this? How can we describe structures in such a way that the elements have no properties other than those relating elements of the, of the same structure? Well, mathematicians have been doing it this way for a long time, in fact. So it's not that the category theorists decided to try to do this. Traditional mathematics led them to do this. Because traditional mathematics was like this. In traditional mathematics, the elements already have no properties other than relations to, to others. Uh, Dedekind. Dedekind does not define real numbers as Dedekind cuts. Do you, do, does everybody know about, about Dedekind cuts? Dedekind says, okay, we know pretty well what the, what the rational numbers are. And we know what is the rational number line. Well, you can see I'm never going to finish drawing the rational number line. Uh, I'm going back and I'm filling it in denser and denser because it's the rational. Dedekin says we know pretty well what these are, but what is the real one? What is the continuum? He says a lot of people think this one is continuous because between any two rationals, there's another one. But he says, no, this is not continuous. And you can see it's not continuous because um, for x greater than 0 and x squared greater than 2, there's a lot of reals that have that property. We'll put 0 here. And for x less than 0 or x squared less than 2, there's a lot of them. But there's nothing in between. There's a gap because the square root of 2, what would be in between is the square root of 2, and it's not a rational number. That's known for a long time. Plato talks about that. Um, so Dedekind says the real numbers, for every cut on the rationals, any time you can divide the rationals into two parts, where everything on one part is greater than everything in the other, they come up and they come arbitrarily close to each other, there is a real number. Every cut like this is generated by a real number. It could be generated by a rational number, or it could be generated by an irrational number. So Dedekind says, here's how we should understand the irrational numbers there, the cuts here. Well, real numbers are cuts on the rational line. We now call them Dedekind cuts. Dedekind didn't call them Dedekind cuts. He says, for every, well, he doesn't say they are. He says, there's a real number for every cut on the real line. And he writes to Weber, his student Weber, a sharp guy, Weber, wrote a wonderful textbook, a wonderful three-volume textbook. And Weber writes back and says, why don't you just say that the real number is the Dedekind cut? Which is what a lot of people say, and I've said it a few times just because I've heard it so often. I've said it right in front of you. Dedekind finds a real number as a cut. No. Dedekind says for every cut there is a real number. So Weber says, why don't you say that the real number is just the Dedekind cuts? The, the real numbers will be the set of Dedekind cuts on the rationals. And Dedekind wrote back and said, that's an interesting idea. Somebody should see if it works. Well, it's a, it's a standard method. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting idea. Somebody should see whether it works. But I don't, I, I'm not going to do that. He says, I believe that we are of a godlike race 
And, and our minds undoubtedly possess creative power, not only in railroads and telegraphs, but above all in things of the mind. Dedekind says, no, real numbers, we create a real number for every Dedekind cut. The, de the real number is not the Dedekind cut, we create one. Weber wants to know, how do you know our minds can create these things? He says, I do know. Our minds can create these things. <laughs> so for, for Dedekind, a Dedekind cut has no properties except that it's related. I mean, a real number has no properties except that it's related to a partition of the reals. It isn't that partition of the reals. It's what he calls a new object. And he explains new objects a few times. Like by a new object, I mean it has no properties except the defining property. It, it doesn't have the proper the, the real number the real number pi doesn't it has the property that it's greater than zero. It does not have the property that two is an element of it. Now, if you define real numbers as lower Dedekind cuts, 2 would be an element of pi. And Weber was right. You could define it that way if you wanted to. But Dedekind won't have this. No, I, I don't have No, I want only the relations to each other and the relations to cuts on the rationals. That's Dedekind's structuralism. The real numbers have no properties so that their relations to each other and their relations to cuts. The natural numbers, he says, have no properties except their place in the natural number order. They aren't this set or that set. They have no properties for those relations. Dedekind does not give a very good theory of how that can be. He just says, our minds can do this. So Benassar and others, they say, well, let's give a theory of how this could be. So then they, they start wanting to define structures in some way. And, and they look to model theory here. They say, well, I mean, a natural number, it's, it's, not a, it's not an element of some given model of the Peano axioms, because they think models are all defined in some of the set theory, so they all have individuating properties. Um, but it's, it's somehow it's the equivalence class of all the positions in all the models, so that then doesn't have any special properties. So you, you, we take all the models together and then take the equivalence class of all those. Um, Helmut, we have Ben Asraf and Resnick have, have argued for such things. Jeff Hellman and Stuart Shapiro have, have written books promoting these kind of these structuralist theories. Some theory where structures will somehow have these properties. Um, to my mind, it has not always been clear what they want out of this. Yeah. I do know what mathematicians wanted out of category theory. They wanted discoveries and proofs. I'm not as clear. Um, some, philosophers, some structuralist philosophers say they want to describe what's going on in mathematics today. The problem is they don't, they don't think, quote, a lot of math books. To me, if you're to describe what's going on in mathematics, you should quote math books. Um, others say, I'm not interested in what's going on in mathematics, I'm interested in seeing what could be done. Well, but what would count as success? What, what would count as, as, as a good theory? Because we don't know what, what the theory is meant to do. But I want to stress that Riemann got deep results in geometry and complex analysis by describing spatial relations between many spaces. Uh, Riemann, most famously, his, his Riemann surfaces. Riemann is interested in in the complex numbers as a sphere, again, I don't know if everybody's familiar with this. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, zero will sit there. Uh, one. No, I don't want one there. Where do, where do I want? Oh, no, 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 no. That's. 
Oh yeah, yeah, I do want one there. This will be the circle of complex of complex numbers of magnitude one. This is it's seen as being spread out over the complex plane, projected down like this. So one got projected out to some place there. Zero got projected right down to there. Uh, well, I'm not drawing that very well. Well, anyway, I'll put that. What is the squaring function? The squaring function takes a sphere and wraps it twice around this one. So the point at infinity up here and the point at zero, those are where the wrappings cross each other. You square a, 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 you square a complex number by doubling the angle and also squaring the magnitude. Anyway, so he looks at surfaces covering each, covering each other. He, he proves a great deal of complex analysis. Oh, I see I've been touching this thing. Riemann has no theory of the continuum. Riemann has no theory of what is a real number, let alone what is a complex number. He just knows how to do analysis with them. Riemann has no set theory, no set theoretic analysis of this at all. So the question is, how could you do complex analysis without a set theoretic definition of the continuum? We'll go read Riemann. He did complex analysis without a set theoretic analysis, a, a set theoretic definition of the continuum. And what he does is he talks about the relations between various spaces. Um, this is an example, I'm, I'm encouraged to think that with this audience I can talk about the fundamental group of a, of a surface. Um, I will explain what it is. I will explain what it is. Do you think if I explain what it is? Let, let's, let's try. Um, <laughs> Out of all this complex analysis, Riemann comes up with the sphere is going to matter a lot to him. The torus is going to matter. This is, these are things he wants to look at to solve differential equations, to solve hard differential equations. He's going to look at the topology of these things. He, can, he turns problems in analysis with its derivatives and its very complicated calculations into problems of topology. The point is, these spaces are to be seen as flexible, stretchable. They have no definite shape. They have no definite size. They do have a definite connection. A sphere, the surface of a ball, looks different from the surface of a donut. The donut surface has a hole through the middle of it. Or again, you could have a donut surface with two holes through it. And people give these to babies to chew on. They baby two toys. The baby gets to hold this and chew on the other side. <laughs> and Riemann's interested in these things, and he wants to understand what's, how, do you how do you describe these shapes in a way that doesn't depend on their actual size, it doesn't depend on actual dimensions, because these things can be stretched and bent. Well, here's, here's a comparison. Take any loop on this. Actually, do we, do we have another color of marker? It kind of helps if I've got two colors of marker. Yeah, uh, three colors. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to need a third. So the, the black outline, that's the shape of the object. <coughs> Consider any loop drawn on this. And maybe it's a very complicated loop drawn on the, on the sphere surface. No matter how complicated it is, we can shrink it down a little bit. We can shrink it down to a smaller loop. And in fact, we can shrink it down to a point. Any loop you draw on this, you can shrink down to a point. A lot of loops you can draw on this, on, on this you can also shrink down. And finally, to a point. But there are loops you can draw here that you cannot shrink down to a point. 
let that one go around the surface. That one you can't shrink down to a point. Everyone here can be, that one can't be. That's a topological difference. It doesn't depend on stretching or bending or anything. Uh, well, here's the time to use the other color. Here is another loop that you can't shrink down to a point. Now, there are lots of loops you can't shrink down to a point. But, let's consider two loops the same if one of them can be sort of shrunk down onto the other. If I can move the one and the other and get them to coincide. So, let's, say, let's ignore this, this red one for a moment. We'll get rid of that. There's this loop, and then there's that loop. Well, I can take this one, and I can swing it over, and I can straighten it out and match it onto that one. Let's say two loops are equivalent if, if they can be stretched onto each other. Over here, all loops are equivalent to a point. Over here, not all loops are equivalent to a point. Lots of loops are equivalent to each other. Every loop over here, it turns out, is equivalent to some combination of that one and this one. Maybe I go around this one once, then around this one that way, then around that one the other way. Some, any loop you draw can be shrunk down to some combination of these two loops, maybe in opposite directions. Over here, oh, I don't have this, this slide on this one. Over here, we've got that loop, but also that loop. See, I've come around this way, I've come around that way. And then I've also got um, that loop and that one. Over here, every loop is some combination of these four. The thing is that given two loops that start and end at the same point, however complicated they are, I've got this loop that starts and ends here, and then I've got this other loop that, that starts and ends at the same point. I can open these up, and I can connect those two there, and I can make a single loop that starts and ends at that point. You see how I can take any, any two loops if I got one loop from that point and another loop, I can, open, I can put two ends of them together and make it a single loop that still starts at that point. This is what we call a group. Well, this is the group of loops, if you want to put it that way, of equivalence classes of loops. So, Given any topological space, I can talk, and this is called, this group is called the fundamental group of the space. Pi, the fundamental group of whatever space you're talking about. With every topological space, I associate a fundamental group. Riemann knew a lot about this. Riemann knew that two Riemann surfaces are topologically isomorphic if and only if they have the same fundamental group. There's a lot of, lot of Riemann surfaces, and they don't look much like each other. But any two, that when you look at their loop space, including this homology, where we put the homotopy, where things count as equivalent if you can bend them into each other, if they have the same group, they're topologically isomorphic. Not analytically isomorphic. There's a topological map that takes the one of them and covers it over the other one so that they exactly cover each other, but that map in general won't have a complex derivative. It will not be an analytic map. So now it becomes very important to take all the Riemann surfaces with a given fundamental group and ask separate them into the ones that are, com that are, are complex analytic, isomorphic, because any one group, they're all topologically isomorphic, they're not analytically isomorphic.
And it should be clear that this kind of thing with loops doesn't just work for these surfaces. I could do this kind of thing with any topological space. As long as I know what's meant by a continuous loop and continuously stretching and bending that loop and deforming it, I can assign a fundamental group to any topological space. Now the truth is that for some bizarre topological spaces, the fundamental loop is bizarre too, but for a lot of them. This is a this is um, this is a chewing gum card of Bernard Riemann. This this chewing gum company put they mostly put cards of baseball players in the gum. You've seen gum with baseball players in it. Well, they put one with a mathematician, Bernard Riemann, for ideas for minds that made the future. Um, <laughs> He describes the torus without ever saying what its points are, just by continuous maps to it from the circle. He couldn't tell you what its points are. He has never heard of a way of saying what the points are. So you may have a Frankel set theory over this, okay, but he, this is a long time before that, 80 years before. He will describe the torus and its distinction from the sphere, its distinction from the two-handled torus, just by continuous maps to it from the circle. He describes the topology of the torus without specifying a size or precise shape. Notice, these paths, it doesn't matter if I stretch and bend the torus. The paths will stretch and bend with it. They, they really don't care what size the torus is or exactly how I've shaped it. They only care how many holes there are in it. He assigns a fundamental group to the torus <coughs> in a way that obviously assigns an analogous fundamental group to any topological space. We will be coming back to this. We will come to back to this after defining categories, functors, and natural transformations. Again, I, I guess I, I, I hate to say the same thing over and over again, but, but my friends who think, well, you can, only, you can only do this kind of thing with, with Zermel and Frankel set theory. Riemann, was, Riemann died 50 years before Zermelo Frankel set theory was invented. It's not true that you can only do this with Zermelo Frankel set theory. Now, it could still be true that you can only do it with precise rigor in ZFC. This doesn't, maybe Riemann, Riemann did not, in fact, have precise rigor by modern standards. And that's an important thing to understand about the progress of mathematics. Riemann was right. He gave beautiful theorems, deep, penetrating theorems that still inspire research today but his proofs were incomprehensible to everyone but his own students. Only people who had worked with him could read these proofs. You get great mathematicians like Karl Weierstrass in Berlin. You, uh, if, you, if you know any history of math, you've heard of Karl Weierstrass. Very important for setting up a rigorous modern analysis. Weierstrass once said, when Riemann announces a theorem, I assume it's correct and I try to find a proof of it. He's not going to be able to read Riemann's proof. But he figures it'll be right. <laughs> so maybe it could still, as far as this goes, it could still be true that to get rigorous mathematics, you need something close to ZFC. Nobody thinks you need exactly ZFC, but you might need something close to it. What we found through Bill Walbeer's efforts, no, you don't. Well, it depends how close you want, but um, category theory can, in fact, give rigorous proofs. Riemann doesn't prove that you could give rigorous proofs without ZFC because he didn't give rigorous proofs. But he proves you can be right without ZFC because he was. <laughs> I'm going to write and draw the category axioms because I think it's important. I want you to see how these things work. A category has objects A, B, C, and arrows F, G, H. So far, I haven't told you what they are at all. Euclid starts out as saying, a, law, a point is that which has no parts. Nobody has ever found that an important observation. An arrow goes from an object A to an arrow B. We say it has domain A and codomain B, and we draw it this way. Okay, arrows are transformations between objects, and all I mean by that at this point is that an arrow starts at an object and ends at the object. And what do I mean by starts and ends? Nothing at all. I'm just, it's just terminology. Arrows, if one arrow 
ends at the, at the object where another starts, then they compose. They have a composite. So we have arrows, we have objects, arrows. An object has an identity arrow, such that composing anything with the identity gives you that thing. The identity arrow, if you want to think of it as a transformation, it's a transformation that does nothing. It's the simplest possible way of walking around the room where you just stand still. That counts as walking around. In terms of a picture, well, this arrow, there's an identity on its domain, and the composite is the arrow. There's an identity on its codomain, the composite is just the arrow. Composition is associative. If A ends where, where if F ends where G starts, and G ends where H starts, then the composite doesn't matter how you parenthesize it. It's associative. There are non-associative algebras used in mathematics, but non-associative algebras are complicated. Associative law. Um, and that's it. That's the axioms. In, in a picture, it doesn't matter if, if I've got F and G and H, it doesn't matter if I compose these two first and then compose with F, or compose these two first and then compose with H. I'll get the same thing. And that's all the category axioms. Again, the point I raised before, this is not a foundation for mathematics. You cannot deduce arithmetic from these axioms. Let alone are you going to deduce analysis or functional analysis. Notice, I haven't said anything exists. I said, if there's an object that has an identity arrow, I haven't said there's any objects. There's an empty category. That satisfies these axioms. Just, uh, of course, in some kinds of traditional first order logic, that's not allowed because we require a non empty domain. I think standard theory requires a non empty domain. Uh, category theory doesn't. There's an empty category. It's important to make a category. And that's. That's all of the axioms. So there's some finite categories. There's the, the category, okay, the category zero, I didn't draw a picture of it because there's nothing in it. There's just nothing there. The category one has an object. In diagramming categories, we don't draw the identity arrow. The identity arrow just goes with the object. You know there's an identity arrow, it's an object. It, this is an object that has an identity arrow. The category two has two objects. Of course, it has their identity arrows, but we don't draw those. And it has an arrow between them. And that's all. The category three has three objects and arrows as shown. Now, that does mean these two arrows have to have a composite. It has to go from here to there. So it has to be that arrow, because that's the only one that does go from one to the other. So I don't have to specify the composition law. It's the only thing it could be. These are finite categories. Now, I haven't told you what the objects are. From one surveil or Frankel point of view, I should have said A1 element category has, I mean, you know, I should, these would have to all be some sets. But we're not going to do a lot of foundations today. We'll get to foundations. Those are categories. Those are a pair of categories. This category P has three, three objects and two arrows besides the identities. We don't have to specify a composition law because there are no composable pairs of arrows. The category E, two objects and two arrows like that, again, there's no composition law to be specified. Now, this arrow is com composes with the identity there, but I don't have to tell you that because you, you know a composition with an identity doesn't change anything. These are finite categories. These all have technical uses in, in category theory. We will see technical uses of them, but my purpose right now is just the conceptual one. That's all a category is. It's just objects and arrows with the requirement that every object have an identity and composition is associative. It's a very simple framework, got lots of models. For a while in the 1960s, there was an attempt to classify arbitrary categories to give a structure theorem of what can a category look like. The way we, 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 we try to describe finite groups, 
by finding the finite simple groups or the finite semi-simple groups, uh, categories that fail completely. Categories, they have no, the structure theory is just too complicated, which is a reflection of the axioms being so very simple. There's no, there's no symmetries here. There's no restrictions on what can happen. The only restriction is that when two arrows meet, they have a composite, and the compo composition is associated. We don't draw identity arrows. This is standard. Category books never draw the identity arrows. And these, like I said, these have technical uses as patterns of arrows. We will be meeting those, those uses as we go along. The original categories, the first categories known. Actually, I'm kidding a little bit when I say set. The, uh, the first category anybody thought of was a category of abelian groups. <coughs> The Eilenberg and McLean said, oh, we need, we, need, we need to look at abelian groups and the transformations between them. <coughs> because, remember, they were trying to explain why the same groups occurred in several different, con in two different contexts, the topological context and algebraic context. So, as a, as a matter of fact, they, uh, they came up with the idea of natural isomorphism first, which we will get to that much later. To define that, they had to define functors, they defined these to define functors. But they quickly saw, saw there's a category of sets. The category of groups and group homomorphisms. I take it people here are roughly familiar with the idea of a group. I wasn't sure what kind of audience I would have. And nobody's going to say, no, I'm not familiar with the idea of a group. Well, a group, it's got elements and a binary law for connecting them. We had this group of loops. The elements were not actually the loops, but the equivalent classes of loops. And any two loops, we had a way of combining them into a single loop. And it turned out if these two were equal, if these two are equivalent to those two, then the combinations are also equivalent. So you've got things and a way of combining them. For example, integers, but an addition. You have to have a neutral level, something that when you combine it with others doesn't change them. Zero. Adding zero doesn't change something. Um, and the group also, the, the binary operation has to be associative. Well, it's true. A plus B plus C is the same as A plus B plus C. Um, positive real numbers and multiplication. You take any two positive real numbers, multiply them, you get a positive real. Multiplying anything by one leaves it alone. And if so, you have a positive real number, one over it is also positive, and then multiple is one. So we've got a binary operation, it's associative, it's got a unit, and things have inverses. Oh, what's the inverse to a loop over here? If I'm in, if I'm in some space and I follow a loop like that, what's the inverse? Well, it's just we turn the loop around. The way we combine them is we do this. So the combination of the loop and its opposite looks like this. And I can shrink it. I can shrink it down and can shrink it down to a point. So every loop has an inverse loop. So that's a group. There's a binary operation of loops. They all have, there's a, a neutral loop, which just stays right here. Combine that with any other loop, you get that other loop. And every loop has an inverse loop, and the combination is associated with when you When you walk along three paths, it doesn't matter whether you thought you first walked along the first two and then the third, or whether you first walked along the first and then the last two. However, but taking one loop and then combining it with another loop, we got loop A and loop B. It is possible that doing A and then B is different from doing B and then A. It matters. Walking along one, walking along the first path and then the second may not be the same as first walking along the second and then the first. It may matter which order you do them. It doesn't matter how you think they're, they're grouped if it's the same order, but changing the order could matter. Now, in addition of numerical numbers, A plus B is always equal to B plus A. We call this a commutative group. When the, when the binary operation is not changed by the order, we call it a commutative group. Commutative groups are lots easier than non-commutative groups. Um, but this doesn't happen for all groups. You may have a group where A then B is different from B then A. 
So there's a category of all groups in group homomorphisms, and we're using that when we ta assign groups to all topological spaces. There's the category of topological spaces and continuous functions. Um, perhaps a lot of you, some of you will have seen the definition of topological space, others won't. A topological space, what does it look like? It just looks like something. I will often say, consider some four-dimensional topological space, and I'll draw it like this. This doesn't look like a four-dimensional space in any detail. A four-dimensional space doesn't necessarily look like anything. It's just it's just a space. Oh, we actually we won't depend on four dimensionality. Don't worry about dimensionality. But a continuous map is a map that might stretch and bend things, but never tear a stone. That's a good way to put it. And it's, yeah. Um, so I can take the sphere. The sphere is the hardest one to draw because it just looks like a circle when you draw it. And I can take the torus. And I can take this thing and I can map it all over here. I'll just smash it all down to a disk on this surface. I can take that sphere and smash it all down to a disk on the surface without tearing it. Or I'm just going to have to contract it some. What I can't do if I've got this torus here and a sphere here, what I can't do is map all the points of the sphere to the outside of this torus. I can't do that without tearing because how am I going to get the sphere across that hole? I would have to tear the sphere to get it across that hole. There is no continuous map of the sphere onto the torus that wraps, say, the equator of the sphere around the outside of the torus. You can't do that continuously. You'd have to tear it at the hole. So topology is about what you can do continuously without tearing things anywhere. Whereas, on the other hand, I could take a sphere, I could put it inside the torus, and then I could just contra contract the whole torus onto that sphere. I can cover the whole sphere with a torus, it's just that part of the sphere will have been covered three times over if I do it that way. See, this is continuous for the whole sphere on for the whole torus onto that sphere. But there is no continuous map from the sphere onto the torus, because you'd have to tear it at the central hole. And that's what I want you to understand. We're not here to learn a lot of topology, but I want you to understand this idea of continuous functions. That's a restriction. It's a lot more interesting than just size of sets. Maybe it's not more interesting. Some people are experts on cardinality, and there's an interest in theory of large cardinals. But there's also an interest in theory of topological spaces. The thing about these, for philosophers' point of view, these are too big for standard set theory, whether it's ZFC or, or elementary theory of the category of sets, ETCFs. <coughs> I kind of wish we had a three-letter name. I think three-letter names are better, but ETCFs. I like the one that It's like the set of all sets. You know there can't be a set of all sets. That's too big to be a set. And that's too big to be a set in ZFC or in ETCFs. I will say for people who, who, I'm going to ignore almost all foundational issues, but I'll comment a little bit. There are set theories in which there's a set of all sets. The set theory new foundations has a set of all sets. There are some other things that ZFC can do and it can't do, and in general it's very hard to work with. But you can have a set theory with a set of all sets. But standard set theories don't have it. And the ones that do have it, it acts peculiar. So these things are too big to be single sets in, in any standard set theory. Um, but I'm largely, I'm largely going to ignore foundational issues. 
I'm going to do actually what, what most advanced textbooks on algebraic geometry do. Advanced textbooks on algebraic geometry routinely talk about things like the category of all groups, the category of topological spaces. Actually, they talk about somewhat more arcane things, but they're just as big as these. And there'll be a little note in the preface saying, uh, I understand this is a problem and I'm not going to worry about it. And that's what, what we'll do for today also. Um, yes, yeah, so I want to draw the category of sets and the category of groups. Well, you can bet I'm not going to do very good drawings of these things because these are too big to be sets. But I want to get you a flavor of how to think about things in category theory. Should we break before I draw them or after I draw them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah? Okay, we'll, 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 we'll break them and then we'll draw them. And that way we've got to come back because nobody has ever drawn these categories before. I've never drawn these before. <laughs> 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 就是他和那个你字套的那个意思就是那个耳朵是他不是耳嘛就是个 error 就是那个对吧哦就每个点它都有那个每个点都有两个点嘛它也有一个 OK 就是这样就是这样就是这样就是这样就是这样就是这样就